So now we begin. From now until December 3rd is the goal of finishing the book of Matthew. That is a short time frame because we're going to be hitting the major themes and the major sections in the book of Matthew. If we did every verse, every uh, verse by verse in the book, we would be finishing around 2026. Okay, that would be way too long to do a sermon series like that. So December 3rd is the date, but I want to be very clear about something that I want to ask each and every one of you as you begin this series on the book of Matthew that you make a commitment. Because if your heart is not for Jesus, to know Jesus and to build his kingdom, you will not have much interest in the series of the book of Matthew because it's all about Jesus and his kingdom, amen? But if I'm interested about my kingdom, my family's kingdom, uh, my personal interests, God's not going to really bless this series on Matthew for you. You're going to hear a lot of information. You're going to learn a lot of things. But your life is not going to be really, truly transformed. And that's exactly what the book teaches. And that's what we're going to study, is that part of Matthew, a big theme, is the transformation of the heart. I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles, not just your iPhones, that you actually have a Bible and that you actually have a pen and that you use the journal to write down. And some of it, I'm going to go a little fast. Some I can slow down and I can reprint these notes for you to have at a later time so you can write them in your journal. But the point is, is that when we come to church, it is not a spectator sport. Okay? And I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. And, and not that, of course, this is my church given by its Christ church, but I'm the under shepherd at this church, and I love preaching here every single Sunday. But when I was in South Seattle preaching to an all-black church, uh, I almost beat it because they were so engaged and so saying amen, brother, and so much involved in serving. That's part of black culture, which I love. We need to be more like that. If you speak out and you say, man, that does not bother me at all. When you are 15 years overseas and kids are running up on the stage and running around in circles while you're preaching, and there's like four women breastfeeding their child at the same time, and there's chickens in the background and and roosters, I don't get that distracted. More it's encouraging, I know you're not asleep but you are responsive to the word of God. Shouldn't every Sunday morning be like that? Shouldn't you be so excited to come to church to learn God's word? That's what each of us should have in our hearts. If not, there's something seriously wrong that needs to be attended to. So let us begin, but begin in a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, this is your word. This is not mine. This is not a word from man. It is a word from God. It is your divine inspired word word. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you take away all distractions, that this entire Matthew series would be greatly blessed by you, that it would produce so much maturity and growth and wisdom and eternal mindset in each of our hearts, that we would grow in intimacy with Jesus. We would grow in a love for you and in a love for your kingdom, that, Lord, there would be more simplicity, more clarity in our lives. That, Lord, all that junk stress that sometimes consumes us would all be taken away. And that, Lord, you'd use your word to empower us through your Holy Spirit to live out what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. Lord, rejecting the world around us and all of its lies and deceit and receiving your word in our hearts with a heart full of praise and worship and adoration. Oh, Father, I pray that my words would be of you and not of myself, and that, Lord, you would greatly speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, Matthew is a book about the kingdom of God, and it's about Jesus as king. That's something that you need to write down in those journals. Jesus as king and the kingdom of God. And here's the amazing thing, that Matthew, out of all the four gospels, uses the Old Testament more than any of the other Gospels. And there's a reason for that, because Matthew's audience is principally Jewish believers that were most likely living in Antioch. 
Matthew is written somewhere around 65 AD, but it is very generalized because most scholars are not exactly sure. But, but do know it was written before the destruction of the temple, which happened in 70 AD. Remember something very important. Before Matthew writes this book, and we're going to talk about John the Baptist next week, Lord willing, there is an intertestinal period of time of 400 years. That means from Malachi, the ending of the Old Testament, to the beginning of the New Testament, the arrival of John the Baptist, there is no word from God. Is there a reason, or was that just by happenstance, that there's 400 years of silence? That was of divine intention to fulfill everything through Christ, what happened in the Old Testament. Because Israel was in bondage for how many years in Egypt? 400 years. Everything that you're going to see in the book of Matthew mimics and mirrors the Old Testament, but mirrors it, not just showing the reflection of the Old Testament, but how Jesus fulfills everything in the Old Testament. That's why knowing the Old Testament is so very important, because again, Matthew quotes the Old Testament 60 times. That means 60 Old Testament references in the book of Matthew. You need to know that. You need to write that down. That is very important information as we continue in our study. So the 400 years is for what reason? It is to show that Israel was in physical bondage to show them their spiritual bondage. And the 400 years of silence was to reveal how much Israel, the whole world, was still in spiritual bondage until John the Baptist arrived on the scene to be a forerunner of Jesus Christ. There are two key verses that I want to give you for the book of Matthew. Number one, Matthew 6.33, and all of you should know this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And Matthew 16.24, Matthew 16.24 the definition of a disciple, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Christ. So Matthew 6.33 and Matthew 16.24. We're not going to read the first couple chapters. We're going to actually start next week in chapter 3, but this is the main critical point you need to see in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. And it's such a small, short verse, but this is got, has so much powerful information in it that we don't even have time this morning to go into depth of what all this means. But the word of God says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This whole lineage that Luke, that sorry, Matthew gives different from the book of Luke is to show the legal right of Jesus Christ from Abraham <clears throat> and King David and show throughout the entire book how Jesus fulfills perfectly what Abraham and King David could not fulfill being sinners, Jesus being perfect, the Son of God. And he also, the author will show how Jesus fulfills everything that Moses could not fulfill. So that's why this is so important. How Matthew starts the book is of critical importance. He's going to show how Jesus fulfills everything of the promises God gave to Abraham and of the promises God gave to David as who? king. Here's what's interesting. Abraham came hundreds and hundreds of years before King David, but who is mentioned first? King David. Why? Because the theme of Matthew is to show that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. Out of all the kings of the world, there is no one like Jesus. That's why this book is a kingdom book. That's why Matthew 6.33 about God's kingdom and Matthew 16.24 about Christian discipleship, you need to know those two verses. Without that context of the theme, you're not going to understand all these ins and outs of what Matthew does brilliantly to show the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. So if you come to December 3rd and you don't love Jesus more and you don't have a passion and a heart and everything directed to the building of God's kingdom, will the series all the messages, all the time in church have failed. Yes, it would have failed. You would have learned information, but you would have not had heart transformation. And we're going to talk about what the themes of the book of Matthew are 
And I believe you're going to be inspired and in awe of how amazing God's word is. Not only does Matthew use 60 verses or, or quotations from the Old Testament, but as the book is getting towards the end, he increases the use of those Old Testament references. Very interesting, isn't it? Why is that important? He is speaking to a Jewish believing audience. They need to know how Jesus fulfills every single promise, law, and commandment in the Old Testament as Jewish believers. So this whole idea of this messianic groups in Montana, these messianic believer groups that have their own studies, their own church services, their own rituals or festivals, you need to understand, and you will see through the book of Matthew, how far gone and heretical those messianic believing groups are in the state of Montana. I did not realize how many were in this state because there's not as many that I knew growing up in Arizona as I have witnessed and seen and heard about here in Montana. But they are far from the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot go through the book of Matthew and believe what these groups are doing follows the word of God because it is far from the truth of God what they are doing. And by the end of this series, you're going to see how that all plays out and why God's word is so clear. There's no, no excuse for being confused. Jesus is very clear, isn't he? We're going to give a general overview of the book right now. Matthew is a book of fulfillment and transition. You need to write that down. Matthew is a book of fulfillment and transition. And this is going to feel a little bit like a seminary class. And please forgive me for that. But it's necessary as we begin this series so that you rightly understand the context of chapter 3 when we approach it next Sunday. Number one. In and with him, the old covenant is transformed into the new. So that's why it's a book of not just transition, but of transformation. That old to the new is a powerful, powerful transition. Number two, the theocracy and monarchy of Israel turned into the kingdom of heaven with Jesus as king, priest, and prophet, ushering in the age of the church. What does theocracy mean? It means ruled by priesthood. So remember before... The monarchy was, was, came about through King Saul, that before it was by prophets and priests leading the nation. Amen? And they said, that's not good enough for us, God. We want a king like all the other nations. So God gave him Saul. And you know how that turned out. And then God gave him a very godly king, King David. But look at how many failures David had in his life. Yet he was a man after God's own heart. He could not fulfill what only Jesus Christ could fulfill. Number three, Jesus completes the offices of both Moses and David in perfection. We're going to talk more about Moses today than King David. Amazing. Jesus completes the offices of both Moses and David in perfection. Number four, the demands of the law into the Beatitudes. So all of the law, if you think of Exodus, you think of Leviticus, you think of Mount Sinai, you're talking condemnation and a, a lifestyle that is extremely difficult to live. And then you have ushered that into the Beatitudes, the famous sermon, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. That is the first sermon of Jesus. So the first sermon of Jesus, don't you think that's very important? And would it not give you a clear understanding? It is meant as a transition. So think of Mount Sinai, think of the Ten Commandments. Was it a situation of high intense drama? We're talking about lightning, clouds, we're talking about Israel, building a golden calf, sacrificing it, doing all these crazy things in, in disgusting idolatry, Moses on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. There's a whole lot of drama. And the law of God condemns. And they were showing how much their sin condemned themselves by what they were doing while Moses was on Mount Sinai. Now you have Jesus on the Mount of Olives giving a discourse with peace, serenity, talking about the heart over the stone. Talking about the heart over the stone tablets. The very thing, your heart is stone without the regenerating work of Jesus Christ. I don't care if it's someone that's 14 or someone that's 80. Your heart will be stone if it's not Jesus that makes it transformed. So number five, 
this is what I'm talking about, Mount Sinai into the Mount of Beatitudes or the Mount of Olives. Number six, the prophetic into the teaching office. So all the prophets of Old Testament, now the rabbi of all rabbis, Jesus Christ himself comes in as the teacher of God, fulfilling at the same time being the king, priest, and prophet, the three offices. Number seven, the priesthood into redemption by suffering. Priesthood into redemption by suffering. Why is he our great high priest that's able to intercede for us, that's able to empathize with every weakness and every temptation and every sin that we've ever committed? It's because he was the perfect priest and he redeems us through his suffering. Remember the priest would take the animal, cut the animal's neck, sacrifice the animal. The animal suffered. Amen? The priest didn't. Yes, he had all the blood all over him and all over his hands, but he did not physically suffer. The animal had a quick death, did it not? In the Old Testament, they'd slit its neck and it would be dead in two seconds. That was an animal. Jesus, the Son of God, was on the cross from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Suffering to be our perfect high priest. Do you see the transition? Number eight, the failed kings of into the triumph of the real king through the suffering servant. So Jesus being king offered himself, instead of the king sending out warriors to do battle for him and to suffer and die on the battlefield, Jesus, as the perfect king, suffered as a servant. Was there ever a time in the history of the world that a king became a servant and washed people's feet? Did that ever happen in the history of the world? Never until Jesus Christ. So the theocracy, which means the high priestliness of Jesus, is transitions us from the age of Israel to the age of the church. Jesus makes that transition. So Matthew is clear on the teaching of that. So for people to still celebrate and follow the Mosaic law and pick and choose what they're going to obey and what they're not going to obey from the law of Moses, they are outright rebelling against Jesus Christ himself. They are outright saying that theocracy of Jesus Christ being my true priest, I will not totally fully accept. I have to do these works on my own. But remember, Jesus completed all good works. He completed the law. And when he said on the cross, John 19.30, it is finished. Messianic type believers are the ones that blaspheme Jesus and say, no, it's not. We still have to fulfill parts of the law of Moses that we choose to follow and not choose to follow. They are the same Pharisees as 2,000 years ago. They are the same people. And we're going to talk about those people, meaning every group of people you're going to see and how they respond to Jesus. There's three different groups. You're going to see all of those groups in the Gallatin Valley. Every single one. You're going to see them all through your lifespan. How, like Ecclesiastes teaches, there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing. You're going to see the power of the word of God through this series. Is Satan going to try to attack you so that you miss a lot of Sundays? You better believe he is. Because he doesn't want you here. And yes, there's no way that everyone's going to make every single Sunday because uh, that's not how life works, especially in our day and age, and Summer and Bozeman on top of it. It's even more difficult. But when you make it a priority, God is going to honor you in ways that you can't even imagine. Number two, and here is pretty amazing. So I believe you're going to be blown away by this. Moses and Jesus. The Pharisees, Sadducees put all their weight in Moses, did they not? We follow Moses. We don't know who you are, Jesus, but we follow Moses and we're children of Abraham. So beat that, Jesus. And that's what they said to him pretty much every day. That was their heart. That was their attitude. That was their thinking. And Jesus is amazing how he responded to them. But Jesus is the fulfillment of all of what Moses could not do in his sinfulness and his failures. But here's the amazing thing. Remember that they both came out of Egypt. 
Jesus, remember Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt because of Herod. To fulfill the Old Testament, I called my son out of Egypt. Jesus, Jesus left Egypt and went, couldn't go back to Bethlehem, and went to Nazareth where he grew up. They were both called out of Egypt, both rescued out of Egypt. Moses and Israel were both baptized in the Red Sea. That's what we know from 1 Corinthians 10 to. Israel was baptized when they went through the waters. It was symbolic. They were being purified from all the garbage and junk of living 400 years in a wicked nation. That all those gods around him, and they were part of some of that, sadly, that worship of those gods. They were baptized in the Red Sea, and Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. Moses and Israel were how long in the desert? Forty years. And Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Moses received the law from the mountain. Jesus gives the law from the mountain. The law of the heart. We have the law of the written law. But we know through the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is interested in the law of the heart. He wants not your behavioral changes, that you dress evangelical, you look evangelical, you talk evangelical, you walk like an evangelical, whatever that means. I believe most of evangelicalism discuss Jesus Christ. That's what I personally believe. And after 25 years being in the ministry, I believe that more now today than I did 25 years ago. Because you're going to see Clearly through the book of Matthew, Jesus does not have much tolerance for religion. Jesus is all focused on heart transformation. What are the principal themes of Matthew? Here they are. You need to write these down. And if you don't have a pen or you don't have anything to write with, um, I will give these to you again. But number one, Christian discipleship. That is one of the main themes of the book of Matthew. Christian discipleship. Number two, the nature of God's kingdom, or you could say the announcement and the nature of God's kingdom because it is being announced. The nature of God's kingdom. Number three, a heart transformed. And who in this room doesn't need that? A heart transformed. Number four, the needy and the broken rescued. The needy and the broken rescued. And number five, a suffering redeemer. Not a warrior redeemer, as we'd see all throughout history, and what Israel truly wanted was a victorious warrior, political, economic redeemer. He was a suffering redeemer. Very different which is why he was rejected. Number four, what is the outline of Matthew? And this, you're not going to remember all of this, and that's fine. We're going to go over this a lot over the next several months. But this outline is very important for you to know. Chapter one and three is the introduction of the whole book. Chapters one through three is introduction. Now, after this introduction, you're going to have five main sections of teaching. So I'm going to say that again, five main sections of teaching throughout the whole body, the principal body of the book. Four through seven is the Sermon on the Mount. You can just use that as the title for that section. Chapter four through seven, Sermon on the Mount. There was a lead up to that. That's why it's included. uh, Chapter four is in there. Number three, chapters eight through 10, the hurting, the broken, and the needy. Again, Matthew 8 through 10, the hurting, the broken, and the needy. So do you want to invite a lot of people that you know are broken, hurting, and needy to those messages? Yes, you do. Chapters 11 through 13, the responses to Jesus. Interesting. Matthew is brilliant. Of course, it's the Holy Spirit using Matthew, but brilliant what he does. Chapters 11 through 13, the responses to Jesus. There's three responses, and you also need to write these down. Rejection, the fence riders, and the receivers. 
the rejection, the fence riders, or you could say neutral if you want, and then the receivers or the believers. Those were the three responses that Jesus got during his earthly ministry. At the end of the day, there was only two groups of people. This is super interesting. The first group are the irreligious and the insignificant people. Those are the ones that receive Jesus. But the ones that are religious and prideful are the ones that reject Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Two groups of people at the end of the day. This is what Matthew reveals. There's the irreligious, the pagans, okay? that really are they're the ones drinking all the time, that are cussing up a storm. They really have never been to church or they have no much, not much interest in church. The insignificant people, the people that no one knows about, those are the ones that end up having faith in receiving Jesus. From the prostitutes to the publicans, the list goes on and on to the lepers, you name it. The religious, the prideful people reject Jesus. Is there any difference of today? So do we want a church filled with a bunch of evangelical religious people? Do we want a church that says you have to listen to all these evangelical songs and that's all you can do and you have to wear these kind of clothes? Is that the kind of church we want? I remember I gave a message about 12, 14 years ago. I can't remember. And and I used an illustration of a country song that beer is great, people are, are crazy, and God is good. And that was a very conservative church. And I and a little bit rocked their world with that illustration. Why? I did it on purpose. Because they needed to be shaken out of their religiosity and their evangelicalism, which is so destructive to true spirituality. And I talked about repentance and transformation of the heart. And even though the really religious people in that congregation were really mad because people, it was about 800 people responded really powerfully to the message. And so some of the religious leaders were upset with that message. But I had fathers contacting me afterwards and said, Pastor Jared, I went home and repented in front of my friends and cried. So the religious people in that church were pretty mad at the message. But I got a lot. That was probably the most messages I got letters, handwritten letters and emails. Because there was heart transformation. Does God really care about your Bible knowledge if it doesn't produce transformation of heart? No, he doesn't. He's not impressed with that. Nor was he impressed with the Pharisees and Sadducees. This was so serious that during the 400 years of silence, they had the whole, I mean, the laws of Moses and the Levitical uh, purity laws, it's a lot of laws, isn't it? Like, it wears you out reading Leviticus. Like, it's like, I prefer to skip over that whole book. And they added 400 new laws during those 400 years of silence. So God's not speaking, so we're going to speak for God. And they invented 400 years of law, 400 laws in 400 years And all it did was burden the people even more down. It was crushing to them. And Jesus said, you're giving, putting the people a yoke which you yourselves cannot bear. And they were crushing the people. Do you know how much if you have to talk and act and say things a certain way to fit into evangelicalism, do you know how crushing that is to people's walk with Christ? You have to be this certain example, this certain person If you don't look like us, then you're not spiritual, you're not godly. I do not want you looking like me. I don't want you dressing like me, especially if you're a girl. I want you reflecting the image of Christ. And that's going to look very different in every culture around the world. Even the modesty issue drives me nuts because modesty in Africa is very different than modesty here. Modesty in Costa Rica and Nicaragua is very different than modesty here. And when you, when you say, you know, girls get on your knees, I'm going to measure your skirt. All you're doing is putting the law of Moses in that girl's heart. It has nothing to do with her skirt. 
that has everything to do with where her heart is. It's the root. It's not behavioral modification. It destroys people. You're going to see that in Matthew. Jesus is so potent in his teaching about what the kingdom of God is. Do I believe in having the right expectations by the end of this sermon series, you are going to probably see the kingdom of God in such a richer, deeper light than you ever have in your entire life. You're going to see the kingdom of God here upon this earth with spiritual eyes maybe you have never had until now. You're going to see your daily world light up in a way that you have never yet experienced. You're going to see how everything that is happening in the world around you is no different than what has been happening for thousands of years. And Jesus still is and always has been the answer to everything. So chapters 14 through 20 are about the expectations of people, which is very powerful. Chapters 14 through 20, the expectations of people. And chapters 21 through 25, conflicts of kingdoms. It's when the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Jesus collide. Chapters 21 through 25. In the end, chapters 26 through 28 is the conclusion of the book of Matthew. That is, of course, the arrest, trial, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Chapters 26 through 28. We must know that what Matthew is trying to do is to teach us how Jesus fulfilled every single law, promise, and command in the Old Testament. There is no shortage, there is no limitations, there is no defect in what Jesus did on his earthly ministry. He completed it in perfection. I can have the word of God in my hand. I can know that it is the inspired word of God. But what you decide over these next days and weeks will determine what God does in your heart over this next year. And I want to encourage you that as all the work I do and all the work the worship team does, and all the behind-the-scenes work that is done, especially by Amber and Rebecca. All of that work, all of that prayer and attention and crying out to the Lord for your heart and the hearts of your children, praying for you daily, throughout the day, and sometimes at 2 and 3 in the morning. Do not fail that because you put your kingdom before Jesus' kingdom. Because everything depends on what you invest in, does it not? People will invest thousands of hours, so much time, energy, money, and sacrifice everything in their business and in their kingdom and in their family, but they won't invest spiritually in their marriage. They won't invest spiritually in their children. They won't invest for all of eternity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is impossible to be stewards of God's kingdom, faithful stewards, without taking this serious and realize that one day, do you really honestly believe that Jesus is going to stand before you and he is going to judge your faithfulness to his kingdom? He's either going to say, get away from me, you wicked servant, Or he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. People don't fear God anymore. They honestly believe that's not going to happen. They honestly believe God is just going to give them a hug and say, oh, well, you did your best. You messed up a lot, but hey, you got heaven, so you're fine. They do not understand the judgment of Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus came the first time as suffering servant redeemer. The second time he comes as king of kings and lord of lords, as judge over all of heaven and earth. Do we need to prepare for the judgment of God? Is it my job to prepare you for the judgment of God? Yes, it is. You will stand before Jesus one day 
Are you living every single day of your life in preparation for that one moment? Because I hope you are. Because that puts the fear of God in me. Is there anything more important that you can do for your life and the life of your family than invest and work in the kingdom of God? Is there anything? Is there any other joy, parents, that we can have than knowing that our children love Jesus with all their heart, mind, and soul? Should we make every decision of our life so that that is accomplished? Everything. Remember that message about fighting for the souls of our children. What we learn in the book of Matthew is that our children don't need a bunch of things. They need a heart transformation. My four children the issue that presses upon the heart of Tanya and I every day is where's their heart? Not their schoolwork, not their sports activities. I mean, I have, Jeremiah said, Dad, I don't even want to play basketball next year. I'm like, okay. He goes, I just want to do what? Petra Wilderness Institute. Everything goes back to the kingdom of God. Why am I talking about this now? Because we're in April, and I know what happens in Bozeman in the summertime. People disengage spiritually. That is the mark of a fool, not of a wise man. Because the Satan is, is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Is he going to stop? Oh, it's summer in Bozeman. I guess I'm out for three months. And I'll start attacking back in September once school starts again. Satan is going to be attacking you every day. He's going to pursue ways to bring you down to destruction, to bring your children down to destruction. Did what Jesus do, fulfilling everything in the Old Testament for you and for me, did he do it in vain? Or did he do it? Because that is all that matters in life, that we truly know him as Lord and Savior, and that we worship him and that we build his kingdom. Matthew 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All these things will be added unto you. Some of you are not married yet because God knows you're not seeking God's kingdom first in your heart. God gave me the grace to seek his kingdom only and go, saying, Lord, I thought I was going to the mission field, single. But I was seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness first and foremost. I was pouring my heart out and life into the word of God and into ministry at 17, 18. Because I knew what God rescued me from. And I thought for sure I'm going to the mission field single. I was already had that clear focus in mind, there was no doubts. And God stopped me through the accident, my, my brother's accident, and said, no, you're not. Because he was preparing for me a much greater gift of bringing me my helpmate before going to the mission field because God knew I wouldn't make it is that not the reality of that? God always fulfills his word. Even yesterday, seeking God's kingdom first, and Tiny and I had the day to ourselves because the kids were in Kalispell at the music festival, which was really nice. It's not normal for us. But we needed new bar stools, not for our bar. We don't have a bar. But for our kitchen, their bar stool height. And the Lord knew we needed them. And our old ones were scratching the wood floor and they were broken. And I knew how expensive they are and hard to find. And so I just prayed a quick prayer. Lord, please provide the, the bar stools because you can't find them anywhere. They're not even online. 
Well, about 30 minutes later, right down by our house, we found them. 30% off. 30% off in Bozeman? Yeah, that's not normal, is it? 30% off. I literally prayed that prayer like literally five seconds. Is God not our good Heavenly Father? Does He not see every single one of our needs? But, brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe people here believe much more in religion than they do in Jesus. That's why our churches are so dead and so lost. Do you want to live your life like that? Do you want you make your summer count for eternity? I remember that before my friend and I, I was 20, before we, or 19, I can't remember, before we climbed the Grand Teton, the, the highest point of the Tetons, and I had never done a climb that hard before at that altitude. And so I was definitely, definitely a little nervous. But I told my friend, even though we're in the Tetons for a week, this trip will be totally in vain and worthless, even getting to the top, if we make it to the top. If we don't put Christ first in our spiritual growth, this trip will be worthless. And he agreed. And God blessed that trip. And to sit on the summit, look out all over uh, Wyoming and all over Idaho, and see the amazing power of God's creation. That doesn't thrill you like it does to have that joy in your heart of Jesus. Don't you want your children to experience that? Don't you want to experience that? So why not, as we're in, we're in the middle of spring and we enter in summer, why not have a heart to sing, Lord Jesus, no matter what happens this summer, I know there's a lot of trip plans, vacations, all of these things going on. Lord, I want to know you more, Jesus, and I want to build your kingdom more because of the summer than any summer in my entire life. I want to get to the end of August, and I want to know I spent my summer building God's kingdom. Well, Pastor Peter, that means we have to stay in church 24-7. We can't go anywhere. Is that what you're saying? No. Wherever you're at, that you make that your heart focus. Lord, I want to know you. I want to build your kingdom. I want my life to count for eternity. So if you try to make the summer as best as you can and do the most selfish things that you can possibly think for you and your family, you're going to have a miserable summer. None of it is going to be blessed by God. You will feel that emptiness in your heart deep within you. But if you say, Lord, I give you my summer. I want to serve you. I want to grow in the word of God. I want to grow in the book of Matthew. I want to serve you in my heart and life. Are you better than God? Can you give yourself better gifts then the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God can give you. Oh, you'll never doubt his goodness. I've done things that will blow your mind and gone to places that would blow your mind only because I chose to serve Christ. Privileges that God gave me that I blow my mind. Things that people here, the wealthiest people in the galaxy, How many people in the Gallatin Valley have experienced being on the Amazon hunting crocodiles and telling kids and people about Jesus in a tribe that would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for something like that experience? And God gives it to those who put him first. Yes, it comes packaged with trials and tribulations, amen? It's a full-on package. But just like I read this morning in Psalm 30, Though there's tears at night, joy comes in the morning. Do you trust yourself to make yourself happy? That you know how to make yourself and your family happy? Or do you trust that only Jesus knows how to make me happy? Ooh, that is a world of difference, amen? That's the night and day versus eternity and living for the flesh in this temporal, temporal world. Do you believe that Jesus can make you way happier than you can make yourself? If you don't believe in the goodness of God, you're never going to believe it. You're never going to be interested in the book of Matthew. But I know, and I've experienced enough, I'm old enough to know, 
as well what the word of God teaches, I cannot make myself happy. When I try to do it, I always fail. But when I put God's kingdom and others first, Jesus surprises me with joy. Do you want to be surprised with joy? Divine joy, God's joy. Or do you want to try to do it yourself? I've done it myself at times, and it's miserable, is it not? You think, oh, this vacation is going to be great. We're going to do this, do that, and it's horrible. All you did was argue the whole time. Why? Because your heart was not in the right place. My heart was not in the right place. We need to teach this to our children. We need to live it in our lives. Brothers and sisters in Christ, can you not think about what a joy it is will be at the end of August when you know, you know what, the summer wasn't perfect. There was problems, there was issues, there were things that I wish I could have changed or some regrets I have. But by the grace of God, God used this time to bring me closer to Christ and give me a greater heart and love for his kingdom. And you end summer that way and you t- go on a short hike or whatever it is and you just spend time with Jesus and the beauty of where God has allowed us to live, amen? We are privileged to live here. Don't you ever forget that. We are privileged to live in the beauty of this place. They, well, no, it's just because I chose to move here 30 years ago or five years ago. Oh, how carnal and fleshly you think. Oh, ye of no faith. Jesus put you here and he gave you the gift to be around this beauty just because he's good and loving. Why you and not five million other people? Have you ever thought about that? Because Jesus is so loving. When you look at the beauty of this creation around you, that you don't just say, wow, that's amazing, beautiful scenery. You immediately go to worship and say, that is all Jesus. Thank you, because he is the one that is good. He is the one that is giving you that gift. And you say, I'm so thankful, and praise God, I've heard it for so many of you. I'm so thankful for Petra Bible Church. I'm so thankful for what God has transformed my life in this church. Amen to that. Praise God for that. But it's Jesus. He is the one that is loving and pursuing you. Don't you ever think it's because of Pastor Jared and he's with this weird family from Nicaragua. It's because Jesus loves you and he wants you to build his kingdom and he wants you to know him deeply and intimately. That's why you're here. It is the love of God, just like Jesus fulfilling every single promise, command, and law of the Old Testament. Everything is held together by Jesus Christ. And I want you to make that decision before you leave this morning. Lord, I choose to follow you. I choose to put your kingdom first in my life, even through the summer, especially through the summer. Lord, may I put your kingdom as number one. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, only you can transform hearts. And that's what we so clearly learn from the book of Matthew. And Lord, I pray that during this series, you protect us. You would watch over us. You would give us wisdom and discernment in this book that is so amazing, Lord. Talking about the life and the person, the work of your son, Jesus Christ. May we be faithful to put your kingdom number one through the spring and the summer. Lord, if there's any idol that we're holding on to, anything that is taking the place of your rightful kingship in our life, I pray that you would expose it right now. And that you would allow me to confess and say, Lord, I'm struggling. I've got these desires. I've got these insecurities. I have these desires and interests that I need to submit and surrender under the blood of Christ. Lord, I pray that you give me the grace right now to do that. Lord, I pray that this spring and this summer, it would be greatly used by you to build your kingdom. I pray for my marriage. I pray for my children. I pray that your kingdom would grow in my family, my home. Whether it's an apartment or condominium, a house. Wherever it is you're, you're, you're living in right now. Lord, I want my house 
to be the building up of your kingdom. My soul, my marriage, my children, my neighbors. Lord, everything is about your kingdom. Your kingdom is eternal. This world is so temporal. This world has nothing to offer me. Only you offer eternal life. Only you offer salvation. And Lord, we are weak. We are frail. But Lord, I pray that in humility, we confess we are broken people. We are needy people. We need to be rescued. So Father, this morning I give you this spring and this summer. I ask you, Lord, to unite our families, unite our marriages, give our children a greater love and passion for you, transform their hearts. May we never choose religion, but may we choose Jesus. Lord, I pray that this church, Petra Bible Church, would always be focused on your kingdom and not our own. What matters, Lord, is that people come to Christ, that people have transformed hearts, that we understand what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. Oh, Lord, use this series of Matthew to do a great and mighty work in our hearts. We trust that you will, that you will bring many, many new families into this church that will also begin to help build God's kingdom. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching Petra Bible Church Bozeman. We will have a new sermon uploaded each week for both English and Spanish services. And remember, hit like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.